all fails, turn it on. Well, it's good to see all of you out again. Did you have a nice day today? Nice wet day? <laughs> you know, we wish you would send some of this rain down to Fresno. We're uh, in the middle of a drought down there. We have gotten some rain, but not as much as we need to overcome the drought of several years. But I guess those are signs of the times. The, you know, people argue whether the, uh, there is such a thing as climate change. I believe there is. But at the same time, I believe that uh, the wrong reason is being offered. Because every time in the Bible that there's climate change, it's uh, because of the wickedness of uh, humanity. You know, I guess the greatest climate change in history was the flood. <laughs> And uh, th that was due to the wickedness of uh, human beings, according to Genesis 6 and verse 5. And then, of course, uh, you have the days of Elijah. Uh, serious climate change. A drought for three and a half years. Um, and once again, the reason was the sinfulness of the people. Um, so, uh, in, in 2 Chronicles 7, 13, and 14, I think you're acquainted with the passage that says that if the Lord shuts the heavens so it doesn't rain, and people uh, seek God's face and pray and turn from their wicked ways, God will heal their land. So, you know, I believe that there is climate change, but they're given the wrong reason. And as long as the, as long as the disease is not dealt with, the symptom is going to continue. Uh, and we need to let the world know that. But that's not our subject for tonight. We're going to study this evening the mighty angel from heaven. I think we need to move. Is that from last night? Uh, let's continue then to the next page. Farther down. There we go. Okay, let's review what we studied last night to see if uh, the teacher uh, did a good job. How many books are there in the book of Daniel? Two. Two. You're sharp. Either you have a good teacher or you're good students, or a combination of both. How many stages to the judgment? <clears throat> Three. The first two take place where? Okay, what is the first uh, phase that takes place in heaven? The investigation. What is the second stage? The verdict. And then uh, the third stage takes place where? On earth. And what is uh, the third stage? The execution of the sentence. Good. Wow. You're two for two. Praise the Lord. What is the book that was sealed until the time of the end? Which of the two in the book of Daniel? Okay, which covers which chapters? Chapters 8 through 12. What particular aspect of verse, uh, chapters 8 through 12? The 2300 days and the beginning of the judgment. Could some of the events that led up to that time be understood before the time of the end? Yeah, the prophetic chain could be understood insofar as it, it had been fulfilled. But the part that was sealed is the part that has to do with the uh, final uh, fulfillment of the 2300 days and the beginning of the judgment that we described that's going to take three stages. All right. What are the reasons why uh, we know that uh, the little book is not the entire book of Daniel? We gave four reasons last night. Daniel is in how many languages? Two. Two. Two through seven is Aramaic, and eight through 12 is Hebrew. That would give the impression that you have two divisions within the book. Secondly, uh, could um, many parts of Daniel, the book of Daniel, be understood before the time of the end? Sure, so the whole book wasn't sealed, if you could understand much of it before the time of the end. Uh, the third reason is because Ellen White explicitly says that uh, that portion of Daniel, or the part of Daniel that dealt with the last days and the judgment was sealed until the time of the end. 
And then, of course, the last reason that we gave was the internal evidence of Daniel 8 through 12. And um, let me just review that internal evidence because that's the most important. You know, when you actually get to the text and you see how all of these uh, chapter 8 through 12 all fit together, then you know that we're on the right track. Uh, Daniel 8, for those who were not able to come last night especially, Daniel 8 speaks about the 2300 days, but it doesn't give us a starting point. It says, on to 2300 days, or evenings and mornings, the sanctuary will be cleansed. So it tells us after 2300 years, the sanctuary will be cleansed, but it doesn't tell us where to start the 2300 years. So uh, would God just leave us in the dark when it comes to that? God doesn't operate that way. He's got to give us a starting point. So where do we find the starting point? Daniel 9. See, Daniel 9 is connected to Daniel 8. It gives us a starting point for the 2300 days. Now, in order for the 2300 days to begin to fulfill, uh, the Persian kings had to give certain decrees, right? Did the devil know that they had to give certain decrees for God's people to go back to their land and reestablish the Hebrew theocracy? Sure. So what did the devil do? This is chapter 10. In chapter 10, the devil tried to influence, he's called the prince of Persia, he tried to influence the kings of Persia to not give the decrees that would allow God's people to return so that the 2300 days could begin on time. Are you following me? So is chapter 10 related to chapter 9 and chapter 8? See, this is, it's one book with one central theme, the 2300 days. And then in Daniel 11, you know, what Gabriel does, he says, okay, Daniel, you made me suspend the explanation in Daniel chapter 8, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to where I started in Daniel 8 with Persia, but this time I'm not going to go only till the end of the 2300 days, 1844, but I'm going to take you all the way till the setting up of the everlasting kingdom. And so in Daniel 11, he gives us Persia, Greece, the first king of Greece, the four divisions of Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome during the 1260 years, the deadly wound, the healing of the deadly wound, God's people in danger of being annihilated, Michael, Jesus standing up, that's the close of probation, the closing of the judgment. See, Daniel 8 tells us when it begins, Daniel 12 verse 1 speaks about the end, but the end does not have a date. Only the beginning of the judgment has a date. The end, it simply says Michael stands up to defend his people, and then God's people will go through a terrible time of trouble, such as never has been seen, but at the end of the time of trouble, God's people will be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book, they were kept in the book during the investigative judgment when their cases were examined, and then were told that the righteous will shine as stars forever and ever in God's kingdom. Isn't, this, isn't it important to study the structure? You know, we usually deal with symbols, you know, and with passages, but we, we many times don't see how things fit together. A few years ago, I um, prese presented at um, one of our summits a, um, a series on the necessity of studying the literary structure of biblical uh, prophetic passages. And... Um, you know, that uh, is available in the syllabus called The Wise Shall Understand. Um, it's a very important study because, you know, it's very technical because it deals with structural issues. The sequence of events in the, in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, which we usually don't dedicate much time to. But if you don't know what the sequence of events are, you're going to misplace the events. That's what people are doing these days with the trumpets. There are people that are making the trumpets totally future. When Ellen White makes it clear that the trumpets were fulfilled throughout Christian history. And we're now living in the period of the sixth trumpet. We're going to notice that. And Ellen White warns about taking things that have been fulfilled in the past and projecting them to the future. She says many people will lose their faith by doing that. See, the prophetic, the prophecies have a chain. They begin in the days when the prophet wrote, and you can follow each link of the chain one by one without interruption culminating with the coming of Christ. So you know exactly where we are in the chain. But when you take 
a certain link of the chain and you try to put it over here, the chain is broken. And you're not able to see the sequence of prophetic events. Now, let's go to Revelation chapter 10. This is the fifth reason why we know that the little book is the portion of Daniel that has to do with the last days and the judgment. I left the most important uh, part, the most important reason, till the end. And of course, this is going to engage our study for the next uh, three or four presentations. Now, you can find on the screen um, where we're going with this. I'm going to follow the syllabus pretty closely because uh, in the booth they're actually doing the scrolling of this material. And uh, it's better for you to hear and also to see. See, if you want to take this PowerPoint home, you can get the syllabus. It's called Redemption Draweth Nigh. It was, I presented this at our summit, our yearly summit this year, uh, the last weekend in October. And um, this is all written out so that you can take it home and you can go through it and you can study it. You can read the Bible verses, um, read the statements by Ellen White within their own context, etc. Um, before we begin with Revelation chapter 10, now that we've done the review, we want to have a word of prayer to ask the Lord to bless us in our study. So let's just bow our heads. Father in heaven, uh, we're going to study some awesome things from Revelation chapter 10. We're going to discuss the origins of the remnant church. And we ask, Lord, that you will be with us, guide our thoughts, give us understanding, open our minds uh, to understand these complex things from your word. We... Uh, Claim your promise that you will be with us in our midst. For you have promised that where two or three are gathered together, Jesus will be with us. We claim that promise in his precious name. Amen. There's no passage in scripture that better describes the origin, the identity, the message, the mission, and the destiny of the Seventh-day Adventist Church than Revelation chapter 10. As you know, just kind of, I don't know why it left, but here we have it back. Uh, traditionally, philosophy has asked three questions, three main questions. Where do I come from? <laughs> why am I here? And where am I going? Now these same three questions we need to ask about our own Seventh-day Adventist Church. Where did we come from? Why are we here? And what will our final destiny be? If we don't know our roots, we will not realize the immense privilege of belonging to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we will fail to realize what our message and mission are. We will feel no particular pride in belonging to this church. And we will come to the conclusion that this is just one church among many. These days, some of the intelligentsia, those are um, the highly educated in our midst, are embarrassed about the origin of our church. They have concluded that the pioneers were a group of uneducated individuals who had no higher education degrees and therefore were highly deficient in their theology. Like the leaders of the Jewish Sanhedrin perceived Peter and John, they perceived that the pioneers were uneducated and untrained. Some liberal publications, such as Spectrum and Adventist Today, and the probably some of you are acquainted with these very liberal publications that come out of Loma Linda, mostly, uh, would just as soon erase from our history the sanctuary, 1844, and the Great Disappointment. In fact, these publications would like the Seventh-day Adventist Church to be just like every other church, perhaps with a little sprinkling of doctrines <laughs> that are different, like, for example, the Sabbath. This is a great tragedy because we, if we don't know the prophecies that have made us a people that we are, we will simply come to the conclusion that our church is one among many. And there are many in the Adventist church that have reached that conclusion that we are one church among many and therefore we should all join forces with all of the other Christian churches. 
In this study of Revelation 10, we will allow the Bible to explain itself by comparing one text with another. That's the traditional Seventh-day Adventist method. It's being criticized today as the proof, proof text method. But the Holy Spirit has placed within the Bible everything we need to understand the Bible. Because the Holy Spirit superintended the composition of Scripture. He put in Scripture everything that we need to understand Scripture. Which means that theologians are not indispensable. Commentaries are not indispensable. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's bad to read commentaries. I'm not saying that it's wrong for us to, uh, to listen to theologians make presentations. What I'm saying is that if there were no commentaries and there were no theologians, by the way, we might be better off, and there were no theologians, we could understand the Bible within itself. Because the Holy Spirit placed in the Bible, through prayer, everything we need to understand the Bible. And that's true of this passage in Revelation 10. Everything we need to understand Revelation 10 is found within Scripture itself. Now there's one point I want to emphasize as we begin this study. We will see that Revelation 10, Revelation 10 describes the origins of the Great Advent Movement in minute detail. And as we move along, you will also notice that I will use the spirit of prophecy to, you, uh, to support many details in our interpretation. And of course, this leads us to our next section. Why use Ellen White? On a certain occasion, this was uh, just a few months ago, I was presenting this series in a Spanish-speaking church in Charlotte, North Carolina. And after I made the presentation, a lady came up, a church member came up, and she was very sincere. She wasn't being facetious or nasty. She says, if I wish to give this study in Revelation chapter 10 to a person who's not an Adventist, how could I do it simply by using the Bible and not referring to Ellen White? Um, the implication of the question was that a non-Adventist would never accept Ellen White as an authority to interpret the prophecy of Revelation chapter 10. She was right. A non-Adventist who is not versed in the theology of the Adventist church, when you quote Ellen White, they would not accept Ellen White as an authority. That's true. In my answer to her, I underlined two main points. First of all, I would never give the study on Revelation 10 to a non-Adventist as the first Bible study that I give them. We are not like the Mormons. Have you ever had Mormons visit your home? What is the first study that the Mormons give you? About the whole history of the Mormon church. The golden plates, the angel Moroni, you know, the, the Book of Mormon. They lay it all out in the first study because they want you to accept the authority of the Book of Mormon and, and Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price. Uh, they want to use those sources besides the Bible in the studies that they're going to give you after that. So the first thing is believe in our prophet. <laughs> in the Adventist church, we don't do it that way. In the, at least we shouldn't. In the Adventist church, what we do is we present all of our message from the Bible, and then we present the spirit of prophecy after we have presented everything and say God has given us an additional blessing someone to amplify, to explain, and to correct us when we go astray from the correct biblical interpretation. So my first point to her was that this, I would not give this Bible study to someone who is not well versed in the sanctuary. We'd have to study the sanctuary with them first. We would have to study the 2300 day prophecy with them. And we would have to, of course, speak to them about the role of the spirit of prophecy in the remnant church. Only then would they be ready to receive a study on Revelation chapter 10. Are you with me or not? Now, my second point was that it's not fair that this study be presented from the Bible alone. It's not fair for someone to say, I want you to present the prophecy of Revelation chapter 10 from the Bible alone. Let me explain what I mean by giving you a couple of examples. 
in Daniel 7 and Revelation chapter 13, you have the prophecy about the little horn and the beast. What does the little horn and what does the beast represent? It represents the Roman Catholic papacy. And we need, need to make a distinction between the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church. There's a difference. The, the Roman Catholic Church is one thing and the papacy is another. The papacy is the union of church and state. You know, when we speak about the deadly wound, we say the Catholic Church received the deadly wound. No, the Catholic Church didn't receive the deadly wound. The papacy did. Because the church was separated from the state. The state turned against the church. So there was no longer any papacy. But there was a Roman Catholic Church. Uh, were the Catholic churches closed in 1798? Could people still take their children to be baptized? Could people still go to the confessional? Was mass still celebrated? Yes. So was the deadly wound the, given to the Catholic Church as a church? No. It was given to the papacy. See, we need to be precise in our interpretation because, you know, if you say it was given to the Roman Catholic Church, well, uh, did the Roman Catholic Church actually cease to exist in 1798? Was the church dead? No. The papacy was dead because the papacy could not, no longer use the power of the state to do what it did during the 1260 years. Are you with me? Silence. <laughs> so Revelation chapter 13 and Daniel 7 speak about the beast and the little horn. We believe it represents the Roman Catholic papacy. Can you prove that using the Bible alone? No. You say, what do you mean? Listen, the papacy came into existence after the canon of Scripture was closed. Right? 538. By that time, the canon of Scripture was complete. So this is a post-canonical prophecy. How do we know that it's the Roman Catholic papacy? The Bible doesn't say it's the Roman Catholic papacy. What do we do? We look for all of the characteristics in the Bible. Now we're, going, now we're not going beyond the Bible. We're going from the Bible to history, but the Bible gives us the characteristics. And we look at the little horn, you know, it uh, persecuted the saints of the Most High, it spoke blasphemies against the Most High, it thought it could change times and laws. In Revelation 13 adds that it tramples the sanctuary, those who dwell in heaven, etc. And it rules for 1,260 years. So what do we do? We take all those characteristics and we look for the fulfillment where? In history. Beyond the biblical canon. Is that legitimate? Of course it is. Let's take a second example. Is the United States contemplated in Bible prophecy? So show me the verse where it says United States of America. It isn't. It's nowhere to be found. Would it be fair to say that because the Bible doesn't speak, doesn't mention United States of America, that the United States of America is not in Bible prophecy? That'd be ridiculous. What do we do with the prophecy of Revelation 13 verses 11 to 18? Once again, we look at all the characteristics of this beast that rises from the earth. It has two horns like a lamb when it rises, where it rises, what its characteristics are. And once we have all of the characteristics, all we do is go to history to find to which system all of those characteristics apply. It's making sense? Now, the same can be said about Revelation 10. In this chapter, we find the characteristics. We're going to see this point after point, link after link. You're going to be amazed at how everything was fulfilled in its proper order. Every detail of this chapter. It describes in minute detail the origin, the rise of the remnant church, the Seventh-day Adventist church. But we must find the fulfillment where? In history. You have to look at the characteristics of Revelation 10 and then you have to go to history to find out what movement arose in fulfillment of this prophecy. Is that legitimate? Of 
of course it's legitimate. We do it with the little horn. We do it with the beast. We do it with the beast from the earth. So how can you say that we can't do it with Revelation chapter 10? Are you following me? Now it needs to be emphasized that the writings of Ellen White and the pioneers are of particular authority when it comes to Revelation chapter 10. They are of special authority because they were eyewitnesses. See Ellen White does not write as a historian about something that happened that she did not participate in. In her writings she describes things as they happened. She was there and the pioneers were there. So they are of particular authority because they're not writing simply as historians, they're writing as eyewitnesses to those events. And I'd like to say that one of the, de one of the deficiencies that I see in Seventh-day Adventist evangelism is that hardly ever do we um, go into denominational history for someone to become a Seventh-day Adventist. You know, I, I've been to many evangelistic series in recent years, and I don't remember any evangelist dealing with the prophecy of Revelation chapter 10. Yes, the 2300 days, uh, the little horn, the beast, the United States in prophecy, some will even go into Revelation chapter 17, the harlot that's riding this dragon beast, this scarlet beast. But Revelation chapter 10, in, in many years, I've never seen any presentation on Revelation chapter 10. And it's the most important chapter for people to identify with the remnant church and really bond with the church. And let me say that even if they didn't have any friends in the church, I think it's important for people who come into the church to have friends bonding with individuals that will keep them in the church. But I believe that when they understand that this is a prophetic movement, they will stick no matter what. Amen. But we're not teaching them denominational history. Many times we're not even teaching them some of the distinctive doctrines of the church. Now let's take a look at this passage. Having said what I did, now that I have permission to go beyond the canon of Scripture, <laughs> and I've given the explanation why we need to look for the historical fulfillment of Revelation chapter 10. Now, traditionally, man, those people at the booth, they're on the ball. They're right with me. Traditionally, the Seventh-day Adventist Church have correctly interpreted the trumpets as a sequence of events in the flow of the history of the Christian church. The first trumpet, of course, would begin in apostolic times, and then all the trumpets fulfilled throughout church history, culminating with Christ taking over his everlasting kingdom, the second coming. That's the, that's the historicist method. You know what the historicist method is, right? That's the Adventist method of interpreting prophecy. You know, the Christian world is so goofed up because they forgot the method. They, they, they don't have the manual. <laughs> so all they have to do is guess. They say, oh, the little horn. Well, what is the little horn? Well, that's got to be some nasty individual that's going to rise in the Middle East. He's going to rebuild the Jewish temple. He's going to make a big statue of himself. He's going to command everyone to bow before the statue, and he's going to put a tattoo on people's foreheads or right hand. But there's no context to... to the little horn. See? They just say, this is what it means. But in order to know who the little horn is, you have to, lion, bear, leopard, dragon, ten horns, little horn. See? You have to follow the order. You have to follow the sequence of prophetic events. Then, you're not going to take the little horn out and project him to the future when really the little horn was fulfilled in the past. So we need to understand the prophetic chain. Now, the events of Revelation 10 are taking place during the period of the sixth trumpet. Sixth trumpet. How many trumpets are there? Seven. So would you agree with me that this must be something that's taking place at the time of the end? Would you agree with that? 
Because if, if it was apostolic times, which trumpet would it be? The first. If it was kind of like the Middle Ages, which trumpet would you expect? Somewhere in the middle. But we're talking about trumpet number six. There's only one more trumpet left, and that trumpet is when Jesus takes over the kingdoms of the world. So this is the trumpet that sounds immediately before the close of probation and Jesus takes over the kingdoms of the world. We have a historical reference point to know when Revelation chapter 10 is fulfilled. It's fulfilled in the time of the end. Now what I want to do is I want to read this passage. And I'm going to go slowly because I want you to visualize. See, we need to use our imagination. We need to visualize the sequence of events in these verses, the order of events in these verses. There's several things that take place in succession or in order. And we're going to study each one in detail. So beginning in verse 1, I'll make some comments as we go along. I saw still another mighty angel. Not like in other places of Revelation where it says an angel. This is a mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. So you have this mighty angel. He's surrounded by a cloud. And a rainbow was on his head, over his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. Did you, did you visualize this? Notice the characteristics. He's a mighty angel, surrounded by a cloud, rainbow over his head. His face is like the sun, and his feet are like pillars of fire. Now we go to verse 2. He, that is the angel, had a little book open in his hand. We're going to see that the tense of the verb really does not say a little book open, but a little book having been opened, which means that before this it was closed. That's an important detail. So does the angel open the book before he descends to the earth? Yes, because he descends with the open book in his hand, having been opened. So he must have opened it in heaven before he came down with the little book. And then notice what he continues saying. He, com he comes down with a little book having been opened. By the way, he has it in his left hand. We'll see that later on because he's going to raise his right hand to swear an oath. So he has a little book in his left hand. And then it says he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. So are you seeing the order? The little book is open. Then the angel descends from heaven with the little book. Then what does he do? He places his right foot on the sea and he places his left foot on the land. And then the next event is that he cries with a loud voice as when a lion roars. So now he cries out. And his voice sounds like the roar of a lion. And when he does this, there's something that happens. It continues saying, when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Those real, the thunders are really the echo of his voice. So he roars like a lion, and his voice sounds like seven thunders. And by the way, the thunders were not simply noise. The thunders uttered a message because John understood the message and he was about to write it. So this is not simply noise. The echo of God's voice actually imparted a message, an intelligible message to John. So notice what he continues saying. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write. What was he about to write? what the thunders uttered, right? I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. So was the message of the seven thunders sealed so that they could not be understood by the readers? Were they understood by John? Yes. 
Should, would they be understood by the readers at least immediately? No, because they were what? They were sealed. Are you seeing the sequence? Now, next verse, verse 5. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his hand to heaven. Now this is the next event. You see the chain of events here? Are you seeing the chain? Or is this all happening all at once? No, it's one event after another. It's important that we see that. It says, so he raised his hand to heaven. It doesn't say which hand, but it's the right hand. You know, you always swear with the right hand. So he has the little book in his left hand. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it. This is a clear reference to what? To the fourth commandment. Correct? So, so this angel attracts attention to the fourth commandment and ultimately to creation. And he swears, and I'm reading now from the New King James, terrible translation, like all other modern versions. The King James is correct on this point. There should be delay no longer is the way it reads in the New King James that I'm reading from. Only the King James gets this right. The King James translates that there would be time no longer. That is a correct translation. And we're going to go through that. We'll see that. So the angel swears, he says, time will be no longer. And then verse 7, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, so is this taking place, is this taking place after he swears the oath? Yeah. So what he's saying is, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, because everything else is taking place under which angel? The sixth. But, but when, in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, not when the seventh angel blows his trumpet, but when he's about to blow his trumpet, something is going to happen. The mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servants the prophets. Are you following me or not? We'll come back to the sequence and you'll see it. Verse 8, then, by the way, the, verse 7 takes you all the way to the sounding, right before the sounding of the seventh trumpet, right? The mystery of God is finished, right before the seventh trumpet sounds. And then if you read Revelation 11, it says the seventh trumpet is when the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of God and Christ. That's when Christ takes over the everlasting kingdom, Okay. But now he's going to go back in verse 8 and he's going to describe something that, that took place before. So in other words, verse 7 is a parenthetical verse. It takes, you, it takes you to the time of the closing of the mystery of God, but then he goes back and he's going to describe something that happened before that in verses 8 to 11. Notice verse 8. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again. and said, Go take the little book, which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be sweet as honey in your mouth. Now, is there something strange about that order? You know, we need to be careful about reading in detail. What is strange about that order? It says your stomach will be bitter, but it will be sweet in your mouth. Now, wait a minute. Food doesn't get to your stomach before it gets to your mouth. So why is the order reversed here? There's a very important reason, which we're going to look at later on in this series. So it says, take it and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And now the order is correct. And it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. Why do you have it in reverse order? 
when the angel tells him to eat the book, and then you have it in the correct order, when uh, John actually eats the book. There's a very important reason. And then notice verse 11. And he said to me, this is the same angel, he said to me, you must what? Prophesy again. Can you do something again unless you've done it before? <laughs> Is this book a little book about prophecy? Is, does the little book contain prophecy? Yeah. Because it says you must prophesy what? Again. So a prophecy must have come from the little book before because he's told to do it again. So you must prophesy again. And the King New King James says about. Better translation is in the King James where it says you must prophesy again to many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. That's the end of chapter 10. But actually, the chapter division between chapter 10 and chapter 11 is in the wrong place. Chapter 11, verse 1, belongs with chapter 10. There are several places in the book of Revelation where the chapter is divided in the wrong place. You say, well, now you're messing with Scripture. No, I'm not. The Bible did not have chapters and verses when the writers wrote the Bible. They were added for our convenience. But in Revelation, there are certain places where, where the chapter uh, is divided in the wrong place. Let me give you one, one other example. Go with me to Revelation. Chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And verse 14 and verse 15. What I'm going to say is that Revelation 21 verse 1 belongs with chapter 20. The first verse of chapter 21 belongs with chapter 20. And you're going to see the reason why. If this is only one example, there are multiple cases in Revelation where the chapter is divided in the wrong place. It says there in Revelation 20 verses 14 and 15, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And then now let's read verse 1 of chapter 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Is that the climax to the previous verse? What does God do after, after he destroys the wicked? What is God going to do after he destroys the wicked in the fire? He's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. Verse 1 of chapter, tw tw uh, verse one of chapter 21 is actually the climax of chapter 20. After the fire comes the new heavens and the new earth. If you don't do it that way, you're going to be messed up. Because chapter 21 and verse 2 tells us that the holy city descends from heaven. Now let me ask you, does the holy city descend from heaven after God creates a new heavens and a new earth? No. Is the new Jerusalem on the earth when the wicked surround it? Of course it is. It says so in Revelation 20, 7 through 9. So if you read verse 2 as a continuation of verse 1, you get the impression that the holy city is going to descend after God makes a new heavens and a new earth. But really, verse 2 begins a new sequence. And I don't have time to get into the fact that Revelation chapter 20 and 21, uh, 1 through 8, actually repeats the same millennial events in four cycles. Four repetitive cycles. So if you, you, you decide that you're going to read Revelation 20, you say, I want to know what the sequence of events will be before, during, and after the millennium. So I'm going to read chapter 20, verse 1, through chapter 21 and verse 8. You'll be so messed up you don't know what planet you're on. <laughs> because it goes back and forth. In other words, there, there are repetitive cycles. 
four times the same material is repeated in Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 through 21, verse 8. And you have to know where each cycle begins and ends. Or else you're, you're not going to be able to understand the sequence. So basically the point that I'm making is that here, this uh, chapter 11, 1 actually belongs to chapter 10. So let's read verse 1 of chapter 11. After the angel says to him, you must prophesy again to many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings, we're told, then I was giving, given a reed like a measuring rod. Is this the same angel? Yes, yeah, the same angel. Now gives John a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, what does he say to John? Rise and what? And measure the temple of God. The altar and those who worship there. Let me get ahead of myself just a little bit. What does it mean to measure those who worship in the temple? It means judge those who worship in the temple. So Revelation 11 verse 1 is speaking about the beginning of the what? Of the judgment after the great disappointment. It's amazing. Now let's review Let's summarize the little book episode. Let's summarize the little book episode. This is the order of events, so we have it clear in our minds. The angel descended down from heaven to earth. Point number one. Then the angel's physical characteristics are described. That's verse two, remember? Surrounded by a cloud, rainbow over his head face like the sun, legs like pillars of fire, he's described. As the angel descends from heaven, he has in his right hand an open scroll, which means that he had already opened it before he descended to the earth. Because when he descends, it's open in his hand. Then the angel placed one foot on dry land and the other on the sea. That's the next e uh, event in the sequence. The angel then spoke a message like the roar of a lion that echoed like seven thunders. John understood the message of the seven thunders, but he was instructed by the angel to seal the message that the seven thunders uttered and to not write them down. Next event in the sequence, the angel then raised his right hand to heaven and swore an oath in the name of the eternal God that time would be no longer. Then the angel gives the book to John with instructions to eat it and told him it would be bitter in his stomach and sweet as honey in his mouth. Next event. You see in a chain of events here? In chapter 10? Then John ate the book and it was what? Sweet in his mouth, but afterwards the aftermath was that he got indigestion. And then the same angel told John, you must what? Prophesy again, which means that the little book is a book about, that, that contains what? Prophecy, that's right. Instructed him to prophesy again from the little book to many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. And then the same angel commanded John to measure the temple, the altar, and those who worship therein. And then comes verse 7, which is a parenthesis, actually takes you forward. Are you following me or not? Verse 7 takes you to the time when, when the seventh angel is about to sign the mystery of God is finished. That's out of order. It's a parenthetical verse. So I put it here at the end. The mystery of God then comes to an end. When the seventh angel was about to, was about to blow his trumpet. And then... The seventh trumpet blows, seventh trumpet blows, it's chapter 11, 15 to 17, and Jesus takes over the kingdoms of the world. Do you have clear in your mind the sequence? It's very important that we have this the sequence of events clear in our minds because this is symbolic and we're, you know, we're dealing with symbols. We have to decode the symbols. Because you know, Jesus did not literally descend from heaven with an open book in his hand. Symbolic. 
John did not eat a book because that truly would have given him indigestion. <laughs> All of these actions are symbolic. That Jesus did not place one foot on the sea and one foot on the land. That represents something. It's symbolic of something. We need to decode the symbols. Now let's talk about the messenger. This messenger, this angel, is none other than Jesus Christ himself. John did not see an ordinary angel. He saw a what? He saw a mighty angel. The angel's face shone like the noonday sun. If you read Revelation 1, it says that Jesus was walking among the candlesticks. His face shines like the sun. Who in the Bible is surrounded by clouds? Jesus is surrounded by clouds. And what are the clouds? Angels. If you read Revelation chapter 1, it describes Jesus as having legs that look like pillars of fire. Same thing as Revelation chapter 10. And then we're told that the angel roars like a lion. Who's the lion of the tribe of Judah? Jesus. And the angel has a rainbow over his head. Ellen White has this interesting quotation, as the bow in the clouds results from the union of sunshine and shower. By the way, there was a beautiful rainbow yesterday, a full rainbow. I don't know if you got outside to see it. At least I saw it at the hotel. Beautiful, complete rainbow in the sky. She says, as the bow in the cloud results from the union of sunshine and shower, so the bow above God's throne represents the union of his mercy and his justice. To the sinful but repentant soul, God says, live thou, I have found a ransom. In harmony with the Bible, Ellen White identifies this angel as Jesus. Two quotations. The mighty angel who instructed John was no less a personage than Jesus Christ. And the second quotation the instruction to be communicated to John was so important that Christ came from heaven to give it to his servant, telling him to send it to the churches. So now we need to identify, this will be our last point this evening, we need to identify the little book that was opened at the time of the end during the sixth trumpet. See, we have a chronological detail. This is towards the end of Christian history. Folks, there's only one book in the Bible that was ever sealed where we're told that it would be opened at the time of the end. And that's the verse that we studied last night. Daniel 12, verse 4. Let's read it again. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. So was the book going to remain sealed forever? No. It was going to be sealed, but at the time of the end it would be unsealed or it would be open, according to this. And then it says, many shall run to and fro. Do you know that expression, run to and fro, is used of the eyes. It says, the, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro on the earth. <laughs> so it really has to do with not, not mass transit. It has to do with the eyes pouring over the scriptures to understand the content of the little book. To understand the hour of God's judgment, the 2300 day prophecy, the time element. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge, that is knowledge of the book, shall increase. Now we need to take into account the tense of the verb. You know, the, the text simply says that he had in his hand a little book open. But the tense of the verb indicates that the book was closed before it opened. So it has to be the book of Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Literally, the tense of the verb is what we call a passive perfect tense participle for those who are English buffs. Now what does that mean? Let me simplify. 
A perfect tense is an action that began in the past and endures to the present. Let me give you an example. I have been in Albany since yesterday. When did the action begin? Yesterday. Does it continue today? That's a perfect tense. An action that begins in the past that endures to the present. In other words, at some point this little book was what? Was opened and when the angel descends the book is still what? The book is opened. It's something that happened in the past that endures unto the present. He opens the book and then he descends from heaven with the open book. And this is during the period of the sixth trumpet. So would it be time of the end? Absolutely. Now as we studied in our first lecture, the little book consisted of Daniel 8, 1 through 12, 4. Remember that? And what is the central theme? The 2300 days and the beginning of the judgment. That is the core point in the little book. Now here's an important point. Daniel 8.14 gives us the timing for the beginning of the judgment. That's Daniel 8 and 9. It gives us the time for the beginning of the judgment. 2300 days, the sanctuary will be cleansed. Daniel 7 describes the heavenly event that takes place at that time. Remember we looked at Daniel 7 yesterday? The Ancient of Days moves. He sits. The books are open. Then Jesus, you know, he comes to the right where the Ancient of Days is in heaven to receive the kingdom. So in order to determine who the subjects of his kingdom are, an investigation needs to be made to reveal that they are truly subjects of his kingdom. Are you with me? You know, some say, well, the believers are never going to be judged. Think again. Let me ask you, in the church, are there wheat and tares in the church? Yes. So does the separation have to be made? At the end of the age, Jesus says. Does the church have wise and foolish virgins? Do they all have lamps? And a certain measure of the Spirit? You bet they do. But five are foolish. Are there good and bad fish in the church? Yes. You say, well, what do you mean fish in the church? Well, Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. See, the fish are human beings. Have you ever read the parable of the, of the fishermen in uh, Matthew chapter 13? It says that after they've gathered the fish in the net, that's the preaching of the gospel, they go to the shore and they separate the good fish from the bad. But the gospel net gathered good and bad fish. Are there people who have a form of godliness but do not have true godliness? Are there people who say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? These are, these are, are um, Christians because they do it in Jesus' name. Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform many miracles in your name? And Jesus is going to say, oh yeah, if you use my name, you're mine. No. Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Their works are exempt. See, we're saved by grace through faith, but we will be judged by works because works prove if our faith is real or not. The works are the acid test of whether faith is true or not. That's why in Hebrews 11, all of the heroes of faith are doing something. <laughs> Abraham believed so he left. Abraham believed, so he sacrificed. Abel believed, so he offered. Noah believed, so he built an ark. They were doing something. They showed their faith by what they did. Are you with me? So many people in the church say, Lord, Lord, but they don't do. And they will be found wanting. 
So in the purpose of the, of the heavenly judgment that is described in Daniel chapter 7 is to separate true believers from counterfeit believers. That's, and it's only believers that come to view in this judgment before the second coming. Only believers. You say, why, why only believers? Very simple. The wicked don't enter into the judgment before the second coming. There's no urgency to do it because they're going to be left here. That can be done later. But there is an urgency for Christ to determine who are subjects of his kingdom because when he comes, he's going to take them with him. So he has to reveal before that he has a right to take them with him. Does that make sense? See, Adventist theology makes sense. It all fits together perfectly. But people disbelieve because because they're not rooted, they don't study scripture, they don't, read, they don't read Ellen White, they don't try to see how everything fits together. The, the Adventist church does not have a collection of doctrines, it's a system of doctrine. It's linked and connected with the other doctrine. If one falls, the rest fall. So Daniel 8.14 gives us the timing for the beginning. 2300 days, the sanctuary will be cleansed. Daniel chapter 7 describes that heavenly judgment. It describes what takes place beginning in 1844. And the beautiful thing is that Revelation chapter 10 and chapter 14, 6, and 7 gives the earthly announcement of that judgment. The first angel says, on earth, the hour of his judgment has come. So Daniel 8 gives us the timing. Daniel 7 gives us the description. And Daniel and Revelation 10 and Revelation 14, 6, and 7 gives the earthly proclamation of that judgment. Now let me read you a few statements from Ellen White on this little book. It was the lion of the tribe of Judah who unsealed the book and gave it to John, and gave to John the revelation of what should be when in these last days. So what does the little book contain? All of Daniel? No. The part of Daniel that has to do with the last days. Then she says, Daniel stood in his lot to bear his testimony. Was Daniel alive in 1844? So what does this mean? He stood in his lot to bear his testimony. He did it through his book. The little book. Because the angel comes down with a little book. Daniel speaks through his little book. That's how he stands in his lot. Daniel stood in his lot to bear his testimony, which was sealed until when? Until the time of the end. And what is it that unseals the book? When the first angel's message should be proclaimed. What takes the seal off of the book? The proclamation of what? Of the first angel's message. What does the first angel say? The hour of his judgment has come. So what removes the seal is the proclamation of the judgment hour. She continues writing here. These matters are of infinite importance in these last days. There it is again. But while many shall be purified and made white and tried, the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand. How true this is, Ellen White states. Sin is the transgression of the law. And those in the denominational churches who will not accept the light in regard to the law of God will not understand the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. If you reject the law, you cannot understand the three angel's messages, is what it's saying. And then she says, the book of Daniel is unsealed in the revelation to John and carries us forward to where? to the last scenes of this earth's history. So the little book speaks about the last scenes of the history of this world. Here's another one, Great Controversy 356. The message of salvation has been preached in all ages. Is that true? The gospel has been preached in all ages? Yeah, since Genesis 315. <laughs> but this message, she's referring to the first angel's message, the hour of his judgment has come, is a part of the gospel which, which could be proclaimed only in the last days. For only then would it be true 
that the hour of judgment had come. Are you understanding your point? Could Martin Luther preach the hour of God's judgment has come? Could Paul? No. Could John Wesley? No. Why not? Because the hour of God's judgment hadn't come. <laughs> so she says the, the message of the judgment that comes from the little book could only be proclaimed when the hour of God's judgment had come at the conclusion of the 2300 days. She continues saying, the prophecies present a succession of events, you know, the prophetic chain that I talked about, beginning with Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, uh, the empire of Rome, the ten kingdoms, the little horn, 1260 years, and then the judgment. She says, the prophecies present a succession of events leading down to the opening of the judgment. What is the part that, uh, that, is, that could not be understood? The judgment aspect. Although what led up to the judgment could be understood because it was fulfilled prophecy. Then she says, this is especially true of the book of Daniel, but that part of his prophecy which related to the last days. Daniel was bidden to close up and seal to the time of the end. Not till we reach this time could a message concerning the judgment be proclaimed based on the fulfillment of these prophecies. But at the time of the end, says the prophet, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And then two other quotations here. The words of the angel to Daniel relating to the last days were to be understood in the time of the end. At that time, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. The wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And then you have this short statement of Ellen White where she specifically refers to the time element of the 2300 days and she says that that was the unsealing of the book. The unsealing of the little book was the message in relation to time. So when the 2300 day prophecy begins to be proclaimed, the seal is taken off the little book. When uh, did the preaching of the judgment our message begin? It didn't begin in 1844. It began before that. William Miller was using Daniel 8.14 as early as 1818. He was referring to Daniel 8.14 that the hour of the judgment was very near. He said 1843. He was wrong about the event. But he was pretty close to the timing of the event. Now, one further point, actually two points, and then we'll be finished. When was the little book unsealed? It happens just before the seventh angel blows, right? So it must be at the very end of time. Let me read you this statement from Ellen White. She's speaking about... Um, about the first angel's message. This is important, she pinpoints when the time of the end begins. That's the moment when the little book would be unsealed. Speaking about the first angel's message, she says, no such message has ever been given in past ages. Paul, as we have seen, did not preach it. He pointed his brethren into the then far distant future for the coming of the Lord. Isn't that right, that Paul saw the coming? He said, man, Jesus can't come until the apostasy takes place, or the man of sin is revealed. <laughs> That's a reference to the little horn of Daniel 7. So, so Paul is saying, Jesus isn't going to come until this great apostasy takes place. So Paul didn't preach this first angel's message. Then she says, the reformers did not proclaim it. Martin Luther placed the judgment about 300 years in the future from his day. And now notice this carefully. But since 1798, the book of Daniel has been unsealed. When was the little book unsealed? In 1798. Now we have a, the, the pinpointed time. 
She says, since 1798, the book of Daniel has been unsealed. Knowledge of the prophecies, notice, not, not, not scientific knowledge. Knowledge of the prophecies has what? Has increased. And many have proclaimed the solemn message of the judgment near. And among those that preached were, for example, La Cunza. He was a Jesuit. But he preached the soon coming judgment. Joseph Wolf. Ellen White mentions these in Great Controversy. They, they preached right before, right before her time. Bengel, Gaussin, William Miller, Fitch, Litch, even children in Europe proclaimed that the hour of God's judgment had come. So in 1798, you have great interest in Daniel 8, 14, and Revelation 14. The hour of God's judgment is near. Why? Because the little book had the seal removed. And now people knew that the timing was about to be fulfilled. Are you following me? One final point that we'll deal with, and then tomorrow we'll, when we begin, we'll talk about the seven thunders. This is where real, things are really going to get exciting. Now, the angel presents a message from the book that is of global extension. It goes to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Revelation 14, 6, right? The hour of God's judgment is proclaimed to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. The global extent of the message is expressed in symbolic language at the beginning of chapter 10. The global nature is when he puts one foot on the right foot on the sea and the left foot on the land, that means that it's a global message. But it's presented in symbolic language. Because it's just pressing the foot, the feet, you know. It's symbolic. But it means worldwide. At the end of the chapter, it says you must prophesy again to nations, kindreds, and kings. So literal language is used at the end of the prophecy. Let me read you this statement from Ellen White. The message of Revelation 14, proclaiming that the hour of God's judgment has come, is given in the time of the end. And the angel of Revelation 10 is represented as having one foot on the sea and one foot on the land, showing that the message will be carried to distant lands, the ocean will be crossed, and the islands of the sea will hear the proclamation of the last message of warning to our world. So the planting of the feet means that it is a, what? A global message. Now let me ask you this. If the message is global, do you need a global church to proclaim it? Yes. Of course. You actually think one person is going to proclaim it to the whole world? No. So, so the, question, <laughs> the question is, does this indicate that, that there will be a global remnant people that will proclaim this message to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people? Absolutely. Because if, it is, if it's to go to the whole world, the church must have a presence in the whole world. And by the way, that's the reason why God established the organization of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm persuaded and convinced. God established the organization of this church so that this church could plant its presence in every country on the planet so that when the time comes to proclaim the loud cry, there will be witnesses globally. And by the way, tragically, most Adventists will apostatize from the church. Ellen White said, like, like the leaves of autumn that blow away, people will blow away from the church. She says, the majority will forsake us. That's the sad part of this whole thing. But, but the numbers of God's people will not be diminished because all those people will come out of Babylon and join the ranks of God's remnant church. Do you think the devil has distracted us in present times from what we're supposed to be doing? You take this whole issue of women's ordination. I'm just going to mention it in passing. Don't worry. Everybody knows where I stand on this point. 
you know, I believe that the Bible makes it clear that, you know, there's certain roles for women and certain roles for men. But it's been a huge distraction. You know, huge fight in the church. And, and it actually is a threat to, to cause a schism in the Adventist church. Organizationally. And meanwhile, the world perishes without the three angels' message. The, pope, the power of the papacy grows each day. Protestants draw closer and closer to the papacy, and there's nobody to tell it because we're fighting internally. Listen, the devil knows that if he can unite his army and he can divide the Lord's army, he won. Another message, just one more quotation, and then one more, uh, one more biblical quotation, and we'll bring this to an end. She states, the angel's position with one foot on the sea and the other on the land signifies the wide extent of the proclamation of the message. It will cross the broad waters and be proclaimed in other countries, even to all the world. Also, the sea and the land could mean the old world, because the beast from the sea rises in Europe, and the beast from the earth rises in the New World, in the United States. Now one, po one final point, what does the planting of the feet mean? Well, we have a verse in Deuteronomy 11, verse 24, where we have an inkling of what planting the feet means. God told Israel that when they went into the Promised Land, every piece of land that they planted their feet on would be theirs. <laughs> Let's read Deuteronomy 11, 24. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. From the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even to the western sea, shall be your territory. So what is the angel saying when he plants his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land? He says, this is mine. This is my world. And that's why under the seventh trumpet, when the seventh trumpet blows, the kingdoms of the world become his. But he's already claiming them when the angel descends from heaven. So were you able to follow what we studied tonight? Fascinating, isn't it? Now we haven't even hardly dealt with the, with the remnant movement yet. But we needed to set the stage with, with this particular aspect. Now, tomorrow, Lord willing, we will study about the seven thunders. And we'll take a look at the angel's oath. And uh, I hope that we'll be able to finish with the mystery of God. It's a tall order. And then we'll deal with the bittersweet experience, great disappointment, uh, the, the following lecture on Sabbath morning. Any questions before we have a word of prayer to end? Yes. We'll do that. Oh. We'll, it's, it's too involved to just give you a short answer. We understand that, that, that it's a chiastic structure. That, and, um, and it has a very, very important point, and we will deal with that. So now you have to come back to the next presentation. Or else, by the way, this series is on YouTube. Secrets Unsealed live streams everything we do and we put everything immediately on YouTube. Because, you know, people say, well, doesn't that, that impact your sales? Yeah, it does. But we're not about sales. We're about getting the message out. Amen. And, um, and the Lord provides. You know, the Lord provides through donations from people who believe in what we're doing. Uh, more than what we would get if we, if we sold the material. Only 10% of our budget is based on sales. So, so you know, we put everything on, on YouTube and people can download it, they can share it, they can, you know. People ask us if we copyright our material. Technically there is, but we're not going to sue anyone. You know, if people want, if people, we have people that are translating our materials into other languages, putting subtitles, doing voiceovers and everything. They call us and they say, can we do it? They, yeah, with our blessing and with the Lord's. It's about getting the message out. And so 
uh, you know, that's our philosophy. All right, any other questions? Yes, Dan? Yes. Thank you. This evening, there's a, there's a display in the fellowship hall with materials. The good news is that because now our ministry is sustained mostly by donations, in this new catalog, the materials have been drastically reduced in price. I mean, I'll, I'll take as one example the, the Spanish Parkins Genesis Code. You know, it used to be two hundred dollars. Now it's ninety nine dollars. So it's about fifty. It's, it's about uh, you know half price of what it was before. And so many of the English ones, the same thing. So um, you know, if you want to go this evening or Sabbath evening uh, to get materials, that would be good. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the sure word of prophecy. We thank you that we have not believed cunningly devised fables. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us to belong to this remnant church, this remnant church that the devil hates, this remnant church that the devil is trying to destroy. But we know that you're sitting on the throne and you will care for your beloved church. We thank you, Lord, for your word, which gives us the assurance that victory will be won finally by Jesus and by all of those who join with him. We want to be among those. We thank you, Father, for having been with us, for answering our prayer. For we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for coming, folks. God bless. Spread the word that we're having a good time here so that tomorrow we have more people.